Turn with me to Mark chapter 9. What's, what's missing in, in life for, for most people? If you asked 100 people uh, what they thought uh, the mission of life or the secret to life or something along these lines, you'd be hard-pressed to get an answer. I mean, if somebody said, what is the secret to a successful life? You could say, well, Jesus Christ. What is the secret to success in this life would be uh, ministering and preaching the gospel, being filled with the Holy Spirit of God and allowing him to, to guide you through this life. Amen. Those are very, very good. And that is a great way of how to live life. But what is it that actually causes us to be successful or to be unsuccessful in life? What is it? You want to know what it is? Let the cat out of the bag. You probably already know this. It's not really a secret, but the reality of it is, it's right here. This. It's what you believe. What you believe determines whether you're successful or not. It happens right here. God created us with a mind to think, unlike any other animal on the face. I shouldn't say animal, but unlike any other creature, living creature on the face of the earth right? He gave us a conscious. He gave us the, the ability to, to sort our thoughts, to think systematically, to process things that are based off of our morals that should have a standard based in scripture. Amen? So what does the Lord say? As I was going through scripture, there are so many passages of scripture that actually talk about how we're supposed to think. Some people actually base success off of how much money they have in their pocket or their bank account or success based on their marriage and how it's going or work and what position they have at work. And they base it all off of that instead of just having a mindset of success regardless of what the circumstances. Circumstances should not dictate our success. Amen? If I allowed my circumstances to dictate who I, who I am and it wasn't Christ, it would start off at six months old, my biological father put me up for adoption and abandoned me and my mom and left us at that point in time. I could have dwelt on that and I could have had this poor me attitude all my life and I don't have a dad and I don't know what a dad is like if I would have gotten stuck there. Now, praise God, I got adopted at two years old uh, by my dad, who I called Larry, and, and he raised me up, and, and then my parents got divorced at a pretty early age, which was pretty uh, traumatic for us, and I could have based my life off of that as well, but I didn't. Now, I wasn't saved at the time, so I dwelt on it longer than I should have, but those of us who are in Christ Jesus, we have an amazing heavenly father who has crafted all these experiences in our life for our good and for our success. And some of them have been tragic. I hear some wonderful stories about fathers who have raised their children and I could be envious of them wishing that I had that as well, but I don't because I have a heavenly father and so do you who is raising us up today. And he is doing a fantastic job. Nothing that he touches is bad. Everything that he touches is good. You, in Christ Jesus, are one of his greatest works. Did you know that? Your life is a great work of God. Do you believe that? Yes. Amen. Well, it should transform our lives, just that reality. And we should start believing that our heavenly father has good things for us. Sometimes the circumstances of life don't seem to dictate that, but it's just a period of time, a short period of time, whatever it is. But our God is good all the time, is he not? Amen. And he's constantly working on our behalf, amen, to make us more and to conform us more into the image of his dear son, our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that right? We should be operating with that mindset at all times, in everything that we do. 
And I'll tell you right now, if we really got that down into, our, into the core of our being, it would transform every single person that we meet. This, this attitude of, of gratitude toward our Heavenly Father would, would leak out onto everybody around us. And they would see that, regardless of the circumstances. So it's all really what we believe. And what we have a problem with is we have competing thoughts. We cannot truly believe one thing and have another equally empowering thought that is contrary to what we believe. It almost kind of nullifies it. And a lot of times what we have are all these doubts that Satan's sowing into our life. And we actually live our lives believing what Satan says instead of what God says. Anybody ever done that? Yeah, we've all done that. But he doesn't want us to live that way. So here in Mark chapter 9, verse 23, the Lord says something, and it's very simple. Very simple. Jesus said unto him, now this was uh, the healing of that demon-possessed boy. The disciples couldn't uh, do it for whatever reason. I mean, they had been doing it without any problem, and all of a sudden they're asked to do it, and they can't. And the Lord ultimately kind of chastises them in verse 19 and saying, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring them here to me. <laughs> How long must I suffer to be with you? I mean, I'm, we're, you're already doing this stuff. Have you already operated in, the, in, in just the power of God and that anointing? When I first got saved, I'm telling you, I was so excited about the Lord, I could climb any mountain. I really believe what the word of God said, and it said that I could speak to this mountain, and it would be thou moved, removed. Every obstacle of life was all, my, the whole perception of life was completely different. And I'm still gravitating to hold on to that perspective that God can do all things, that nothing's impossible for him, right? And he says that through Christ, I can do how much? Oh, really? All things? All things. All things. I just read it and believed it and would tell people about it just like he said. What happens is, even like these disciples here, they're actually engaged in an anointed work of God. And all of a sudden, something distracts them and doubt enters in. And it begins to dilute your faith. Even, even the disciples said at one point, I'm, uh, help us with our unbelief. Help us with our unbelief. Because it's affecting the work, your work. Because of our unbelief. What if we just read the Bible and believed everything that it said and lived our life that way and just believed that? I'm telling you right now, we would see success in everything that we did and everything that we touched. So the Lord says this in verse 23. Jesus said unto them, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Is that a pretty amazing statement? we we'll read it one more time. If thou canst believe, if you can believe all things are possible to him that believes. Now, you can believe in a lot of different things, but I know what he's talking about. Do you believe what God says about you? Do you believe who God says you are? If you do, it will change your life. I'm praying for my children. Do you pray for your children? Amen. Amen. We pray a lot, don't we? Some people have been very uh, concerned, even more so than me, about my children. I'll tell them some of the things that are going on in my life and what happens with my kids, and they go, Oh, man, I'm so sorry. I, mean, that's, I know that's tough. And I know, man, I just, I, I got to start praying for you. And, and I get it. And I understand. But here's what I really believe. God says that if you raise up a child in the way that they should go, that when they are old, they will not depart from the faith. 
I believe it. Period. Pray. Don't feel bad. God's in control. He's still on his throne. And he says, if you raise up a child in the way that they should go, when they are old, they're young. When they're old, they will not depart. So where are they going? They're going to come home to Papa. Amen? So I can find great joy in that. And that's how we need to pray. Amen? We pray so many times over different things. You know, it's like, well, let's pray for so-and-so because this is going on. Instead of praying with faith that God has already taken care of it. Believe as if it already is and it will be done. That's what the Lord says. What we do is we have this, this weird doubt that jumps in and snags every bit of anointing that we could possibly pour out. People out there are dying and going to hell. We're going to go to lunch after service today, and there are going to be people all around us who are dead zombies. These are dead people sitting around us, destined for hell. And if we go in just believing in every environment that we go into, believing everything that God has blessed us with abundantly, we will have so much energy that it'll be contagious. You ever been around somebody you just like to be around? They come around, they make you feel good. Maybe they're a little funny. Maybe they do all, you just, it's like, I want to be around that person. People wanted to be around Jesus. Jesus was that kind of person. I mean, when he came around, there were sparks. I mean, things were happening. There was energy. It was a completely different perspective than what everybody else was experiencing in life. There was power and anointing that was coming down, even so much so that people just wanted to, to walk in and maybe grab a, the hem of his garment. His disciples caught that. And they went walking around, and people were just wanting for their shadow to fall on them. That is powerful. Is that not powerful? That's the kind of life that we should be living, a life believing everything that God says. It's amazing. It's amazing that when somebody comes up here, like Fran, praise the Lord. And we call, uh, we call the Lord to, to just heal you and touch you right now, believing with full faith. Even so, before that, I said, don't even come up here if you have any doubt. Don't even lay hands on her if you have any doubt. You just sit there and you can believe a little bit more when it's over. Amen? Just wait. We want people that are full of faith. Allowing that anointing to come down and touch us. If we believe, he says, all things are possible. Pretty neat, isn't it? So here's, here's what's missing in our lives. I, I, I believe this. God ha had always established uh, goals for people. Things to do. Things to accomplish. We call it purpose. What's your purpose? What's your purpose in life? Once you establish what that purpose is in life, then we should live our life for that purpose with full faith. Amen? With full faith. It's a reckless abandonment to purpose. Has God given you a purpose? Yes. Have you identified what that purpose is? Yes. Then do it with everything you got. This is the only shot we've got, right? This is it. This is the only life that we've got to live. And God has blessed us to give us a purpose, which means that we establish goals in our life. And then we start moving to that with everything we have. That's good, right? That's what the Lord wants for us. It's like into uh, a ship that's sitting in a harbor. Now, think about your mind. Think about the, wh where the battle takes place. Think about, think about how Satan wants to capture your thoughts and what we're supposed to do. God says what? Take captive every thought in obedience to Christ. He's talking about right here. This is where it's happening. This is where belief is. I mean, it's in our heart. I know the Lord has saved me. I know that I believe. I've confessed with my mouth. And then the battle goes on. Do you really believe it? Or has Satan put something in there that is a competing thought that's neutralizing your ability to move forward with everything you have? Ship in the harbor. 
There's a captain at the helm. There's a crew that understands everything that they're supposed to do. There's provisions. There is a destination that's set, and there's a course that's plotted. Somebody fires up that engine. There were men that fueled that up. It has a purpose. It has a destination. It has a course. It has a crew. They fire that up, and probably 999,000 times out of 100, what am I saying? 99,999 times out of 100,000, it's going to get to its destination. Amen? Why? Because it has a purpose. It has a, it has a crew. It has, it has a course. It has a destination. You know what most people do in life? They have a vessel. They have no destination. They have no course. They don't know what the purpose is. And they just kind of fire up the engines and roll the throttle forward and just kind of hope that it navigates itself somewhere, wherever it needs to go. And oftentimes, what would happen if we did that with a real vessel? It would run derelict on an island or if it, even if it got out of the harbor, right? People live their lives that way. Satan wants to neutralize believers thinking that they don't have a purpose or that their past has been so bad or all that other junk. But I'm telling you right now, if we can believe what God says about us and just live for it with everything that we've got, it'll transform everything that we do. The church today should be growing rapidly just like we read in the book of Acts. It should be growing that much. We should all be, be inviting people to experience this liberty that comes from Christ. It comes from him. There is a liberation that happens when somebody gives their life to Christ. And every time that we come together, we're encouraging one another to keep the faith and keep a stronger faith and to pray over each other as Satan is trying to detach us from everything that we're committed to believing. Isn't that right? Amen. So I thought about, and I'll be doing this soon, um, I'm going to take a, a small section of land and I'm going to plant a garden. And uh, it won't be a huge garden. It'll be our first one that we're going to be doing. So it's going to be maybe three acres. No, I'm kidding. That's too big. <laughs> It'll be much smaller, much smaller so that we can manage it. But you know, once I do that and I go to plant something, did you know that the ground doesn't care what's planted in it? It just doesn't care. It's going to grow. It's going to cultivate whatever I plant. And if I plant some vegetables in there, those are going to be healthy for us that we're going to eat. But it doesn't care that they're vegetables. And I could grow some things that are actually poisonous for, for consumption. And the ground's not going to care, is it? It's just going to grow those up just as, just as easily, right? It's going to grow whatever is planted just as easily. And the mind is the same way. This is why the sower and the soil, the planting of the seed, Satan wants to come and snatch that seed in our minds is where it is. We get this, we get this reality of, of who God is and what he says about us, and we let that seed maturate in our souls. I'm telling you right now, it'll transform everything. Satan wants to come instantly, and he wants to sow something else. Makes me think of the wheat and the tares. It's a different uh, uh, analogy but, but there's this competing thing in our minds. We have the ability to just trust the Lord, everything that he says. Any competing thought that comes in that says that you are anything other than what God says is a lie from Satan. It's a lie from the pit of hell. God determines who our identity is. Does he not? Not Satan. And I'll tell you right now, he's real easy to identify when he's trying to sow seeds in your mind. It comes across as fear or doubt or I can't or maybe I'll fail. And all these things begin to come into mind. But then I'm reminded of another passage of scripture, and I love this one. Yeah, so go to uh, uh, Matthew. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. These notes are really good for me, but I've totally not followed them at all. <laughs> I love it. Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. 
For everyone that asks receives, and he that seeks finds, and to him that knocks it shall be opened. That is what the Lord is telling us. Ask, and you'll receive. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened unto you. In everything that we do in life, we should listen to the Holy Spirit. And it's amazing how he already knows what we need and want. We just have to listen to what we need from him. We want to throw out what we need or what we want, but he prompts us. If we'll ask, we'll receive it. If we seek after him, we'll find. And you know what? I've never had a door just open to me that I never knocked on. They don't even know you're there. Knock, and it will be opened unto you. That passage of Scripture has been so heavily on my mind this week that I have just everything that I've been doing through the course of this week and who I've been talking with, I've just I've thought, Lord, I've been asking for you to give me guidance, and I'm finding that guidance, and I'm seeking after what you would have me to do. I'm finding that. And I'm taking the, the initiative to, to knock. And guess what's happening? The doors are being opened. You know what the competing thought is as you maneuver forward doing anything in life? Whether it's work, whatever your job is, making that sales call. You see a guy that's sitting there, and he's a construction guy, just finished lunch. You're about to get into your vehicle, and the Holy Spirit prompts you in that instance to actually walk up to his vehicle and tap on his window, and he will roll that window down, and you can actually talk with him and say, hey, I noticed that you're doing some construction. I'm in the same business, and you exchange the business cards, but the first thing that comes to mind, Satan wants to jump in there, and he wants to say, hey, you can catch him next time, or you're busy, and you need to do something else. And in that, in that just few seconds, you can listen to the Lord, and you can actually go out there and do this, because then you have an opportunity to talk to him about the Lord at some point, don't you? Every time, don't you? Every time. In that first five seconds really is so critical. To listen to the Lord is almost like a conversation that you're having all the time as you walk. You're constantly listening to him and for him in what you're doing. And it can be work, whatever it is. Sometimes the phone might ring, Gerald. And, and maybe you're doing something else and you think, well, maybe I'll just let the recorder answer it. And then you go, no, I need to go ahead and answer this. And you pick it up and it's an order. That's, that's some of the simplest things. It happens all the time in our lives. It's how we need to problem. Satan wants to shut you down those first five seconds. That's what it takes. The Holy Spirit will speak to you, and then you're going to blow it off, procrastinate, or whatever it is. I'm going to go do some cold calling, or I'm going to go knock on a door. And then you turn around right at the last second and say, oh, I'll come back a little bit later. Those kind of things are missed opportunities. If you knock, it will be open. Now, well, sometimes it might slam. <laughs> but that's okay. Once we start living this life where we're constantly living our life out, believing him all the time for everything in faith, and we listen to his word, and we just simply do what he says, he says that if you ask, seek, and knock, he'll do the rest. He's going to do that. Ask, seek, and knock. To remember that, it's very easy. Ask. A-S-K. If you've never heard that before, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened unto you. You can remember that whole thing by just saying ask. And that's what the Lord wants for us to do. He just simply wants us to ask him for direction. And he's faithful to do it. Do you believe it? Yes. Amen. One of the, one of the, the, the biggest killers for us uh, is that we think we have to act in courage, and we do have to have courage in this life. There's no doubt about it. We deal with some very difficult situations in life, don't we? I mean, whether it's family or work, uh, decisions to move, uh, simple decisions to go and knock on somebody's window. 
I mean, different things, changing jobs. There's a lot of different things, but God will navigate us through all these other things. If we listen to him, he gives us courage. Now, he's always telling us to have courage. Look at Joshua chapter 1. He says, be of good courage. Be of great courage. Be, of good, be strong and of good courage. And don't be afraid. And don't be dismayed. He tells them three times as he's giving him instruction to make a difficult task in his life. We do that all the time. Moving to a new place, very difficult. Am I hearing from God? And you're acting on it. So it's not necessarily fear that is one of the biggest problems because here's what we, here's what we, we don't actually have. We don't have a spirit of fear as believers, Amen. right? Amen. I do not have a spirit of fear. Amen. I might feel some concern and there's some natural anxiety that takes place where the body reacts to a situation, but it's not fear. Most people think that that's the opposite. What we actually have a problem in the church today isn't fear. Acting in courage, the opposite, is actually conformity. We're conforming to what everybody else is doing, how they're doing it, you know, what their process is. And it feels pretty comfortable too, by the way, when you conform and everybody's moving in this direction and so you'll just kind of get in line and walk in the same direction Instead of actually listening to Holy Spirit who's saying, no, 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 I want you to go off this way. I want you to go down the narrow path, the one that's less traveled. This is where you need to go. And so you move in courage instead of conformity. Because it's not fear to conform, right? And so what does the Lord tell us about this? We see it in uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do not conform. Satan wants us to get us into a mold, and he's done a pretty good job with the church in America, don't you think? of getting them into that mold to conform them instead of seeing a church on fire like we sing about, that we read about in the book of Acts, where you see that these are believers that are connected to the head. They have a heavenly father. They are children. They are heirs and joint heirs with Christ in life, in this life. And listen, here's the interesting thing about this life. God created it. There's a lot of beauty in this life. We don't live for that. We live for Christ, but we can enjoy those things. We think that we have to you put on some monk clothes and move into a monastery up on a hill somewhere. No, we don't. God can bless us in this life and in the next. But I tell you what, it's our mindset. I remember how successful I was and how, life, how, how stinky life was for me and my family before I got saved. And after I got saved, same family, same job, a lot of the circumstances were the same in life, but it was a lot more abundant. My family was more beautiful. My job was better. Same job. Nothing changed from one day to the next, except I appreciated everything that God was doing. Now I could finally see it and enjoy it. And then on every job site, I was telling somebody about Jesus I had their undivided attention. They were stuck working with me. <laughs> it was great. I remember something that was really awesome when I left this particular company to go to seminary because the Lord prompted me and said, I want you to quit this job. I want you to quit having that salary. I want you to depend on me. I want you to turn in the truck. I want you to turn in the laptop, the cell phone, and all this other stuff, and I want you to follow me. And I thought... I better get some counsel on that. <laughs> but I listened, and I did that. And I remember the last day that I left work, and I was walking downstairs to my own personal vehicle after turning in the company truck, and one of the gentlemen that I was working with walked down with me. This is a person who was not saved. 
I had been talking with him about the Lord. I wasn't beating him up. All I was telling him was about what Jesus did in my life and how he's healing my home, how he's healing my family, how he has given me a whole new perspective on life, how everything's brighter. And I just feel excited about being alive. We were walking down. He said something to me that I thought was pretty amazing. He said, you know, you know, I'm not a believer. And I said, sure, you're, I know that. And he goes, I'll tell you something though. If I ever do get saved, I want to be a Christian like you. I was just saved. I was excited about Jesus Christ. I, I was believing everything that I was reading in his word about who he says I am and learning his character and his nature and who he was. And wow, I was blown away. And I couldn't help but tell people about that. And this guy who didn't know the Lord, nice guy. He's a good dad. He's a good husband to his wife from everything I could tell. But he wasn't saved. How tragic. But what blew me away is that he would say, if I ever do get saved, I want to be a Christian like you. Which means, by default, I don't want to be a Christian like all the other ones that I've seen that have conformed to this lack of spiritual power and authority in this life, having dominion over all things through Christ Jesus. That's how we're supposed to be living life. Every day, all the time, with power. So do you know what your purpose is? I've been thinking about what my purpose is. And my purpose, one, is to be a minister of the gospel. Anybody else got that role? Amen. Everywhere we go, all the time. Now, I've also seen that the Lord uh, has me uh, as a businessman, and he's moved me back into that. And I'm thankful for that. And I don't want that to, to seem to the church like that's going to be a big issue. I'm going to work and, and see people get saved just like all of us should. Amen? That's what we should all be doing. This is a good thing, isn't it? Yes. yes. Amen. And I'm excited because I see what my purpose is. I have seen it, but I know that this life is so short, and it is to share the gospel with as many people as we possibly can. Wouldn't it be neat if your employer or you as an employer were sharing the gospel with all your people or that your employer was sharing the gospel with everybody there all the time? Would that not be powerful? It's a pretty explosive. Some people are thinking, I couldn't imagine that. That would be out of control. That's an HR nightmare. <laughs> no, it's real good. It's a real good problem to have. I've been amazed at how many people, you know, you, you work every day. And you, you work hard and, and you serve the Lord as you're doing it and are able to minister to people every single day. I've worked with you and I know that's the case. It's very powerful to be engaged in society and working with other people and sharing the gospel. And they're watching us. They're watching us and they're going, if I ever get saved, I sure don't want to be like that guy. Or they're saying, man, maybe there's something to this Jesus and I need to get saved. The neat thing is, I know that gentleman and he has since gotten saved. Amen. He came to faith in Christ and he is serving the Lord Amen. with great fervency. People are watching us. Are we walking around like we're defeated? Are we walking around like we're children of the king? I mean, there's something that, that should happen in us when, when you know that you're of royalty, when you know that your heavenly father has made provision for you. It's powerful. Do you have something, brother? Yeah, before you say any word to anybody, it emanates already <coughs> from your whole behavior. Amen. Yeah, it does. People watch you. 
Now, here's what I've got. I, I want to break this up into to several messages because I haven't stuck to this. But this is the Lord's put some, some, some really neat things that we need to explore. But we're not going to take another two hours to do it. And I want to give us some, some really interesting uh, things that we need to do. I'm only going to give one today. And this is something to make it kind of practical. And then we'll kind of move on from here as we, as we go into this. Because here's the thing. I don't want to leave this. I want to preach this message every single week until everyone comes in here and believes it. Amen. And there are more people in here Amen. to hear this because they just gave their life to Christ. Amen. Because you lived for Christ in front of them. You believed everything that he said. Listen, it's revolutionary. When I was reading in the book of Acts, the church just kept growing and growing and growing. I'm not all about having, you know, this, this mega church or anything like this. I'm interested in hearing testimonies of people getting saved and talking about, hey, I plugged him into this church. He lived in Oak Cliff. I was down there doing something, and uh, I got him hooked up with Tony Robbins' church, uh, Pastor Tony, and, and, and he's, he's plugged in there now. And, and hear those kind of testimonies. But I'm telling you right now, the Bible says, the Lord says that as you sow, so shall you reap. This is what we should be sowing, this kind of a life. And we will reap bountifully in the spirit. And I believe even, even in life, in the things that we're doing. When you engage in business with this mindset, God is the first. Uh, I know that Leon's not here today, but it's kind of interesting because he's into uh, network marketing. And Jesus Christ was the first network marketer. Think about that. He, he told somebody about how to have eternal life. And then they went and told somebody how to have eternal life. And then they went and told two other people. And you could see how, how that network built. And we're part of that today. There's a lot of things that he talked about on how we're supposed to conduct ourselves in this life and in, and in business. But when you do it with this mindset, you become that person that they say, man, everything that that guy touches or everything that that, that lady touches turns to gold. It's like they, they don't see the obstacles anymore. They see how to overcome all obstacles because we are overcomers. Do you believe that? So there's no obstacle that should stop us because we're more than conquerors. We, that means that we've conquered something and they're actually more than that. that it, do you hear this? Because this is what he says about us and who we are. So next time Satan says, you're done, you blew it, it's over, you can't do this, you can't do that, it's not going to happen, you don't have the skills, you don't have all this other stuff, that is a lie from the pit of hell and you need to rebuke it immediately and say, I am more than a conqueror. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And there are weapons being formed against us, but my king, he says that none of them will prosper, amen? And you tell the devil where he needs to go, Amen. And you believe what Jesus says about who you are. This is, this is our Father Amen. telling us who we are. Do you believe it? Amen. Here's the one thing. There's something that you need to make a decision on right now. There, there's a, a choice of life. and Different things are going on. I don't know what they are. But I do know that you need to get this one thing in your mind, ask. Ask him. If you ask him for what, what needs to happen or what you need to do, he says, if you ask, you'll receive. If you seek, you will find. And if you knock, it will be opened. Do something simple on your iPhone or iPad or on your computer. Or I actually brought some three by five index cards and try this as we go through this for the next month. Just take on one side or I've done it on my, on my phone. And I know that there's, there's one or two things. These are goals, part of my purpose that I want to accomplish. And I'm going to write that down. I'm going to put it in front of me every single day for the next 30 days. 
And right next to that, I'm going to put what Jesus says about it. He says, ask, seek, and knock. I've been making some decisions through the course of this week that have been very powerful in their results. And I know it's of the Lord. But every single time I have a nagging or, or doubtful thought about maybe contacting a, uh, somebody or, or whatever the case is, I just have been fixated on that. And I act in amazing results. The doors have opened. I found what I was looking for. I asked, simply asked, and I received it. And the doubt was... You're never going to get it. You'll never find it. They're never going to open the door. Who was that? Satan. I identified him immediately. I rebuked him in the name of Jesus Christ. And I said, my Lord tells me this. And I stepped out and started doing it. And it was amazing to see some of the results. It's very powerful. Very powerful. So what I'm saying is whatever, whatever this is that you're wanting, whatever you're, you're needing, put it in front of you. Make it a goal. This is what you're trying to accomplish right now. It's, a, it's something that you need an answer to. And then you write down Matthew 7, 7, right there next to it. And then you put it in front of your face every day to accomplish that. Now, here's what I know now about the mind. The mind will only focus on what you allow it to focus on. It will only focus on what you allow it to focus on. We allow ourselves to focus on a million different things. God designed our minds. He created our minds. And he created us with a filter. And that filter uh, is called the reticular activation system. And I just want to share this with you one more time. Because our mind processes a process millions of of different data every single day. It can't possibly take it all in. So it filters it all out and it only accepts what you, what you view as important. So you choose what's important. To believe God in all things or to believe Satan's lies because your mind will only fixate on certain things. I've done it once before, had everybody uh, look around the room. Uh, you could do it right now just to show you some people. Look around the room and look for something red. Just take a second, look around the room, look for something red, look for something red. Actually, look around. Find something red. Maybe there's something red up here. It's a fire extinguisher over there. I'll just call it out real quick. Okay, good. Now, close your eyes just for a second. Close your eyes just for a moment and tell me something blue. You see how all that sudden is just kind of like, for most of us, it was like, Oh, oh, no, 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 I'm thinking red, I'm thinking red. You're focused on red. I've been wearing a blue shirt the whole time. It's amazing how that works. God created us that way, and he tells us, think on those things that are lovely, that are pure, that are true, that are honorable, that are virtuous. Take every thought in obedience to Christ. Every high and lofty thing that presents itself against our creator, cast it down. It's all in the mind. He's telling us, I've created this way. Just believe what I'm telling you about you. And all things are possible. Whatever that answer is that you're looking for, whatever is that you're seeking after, ask him, write it down, and believe what he says about it. Don't let any other competing thoughts come in with it. Compete with it. And just focus on what he says. I'm telling you, I've seen some powerful things happen. And I remember when I first got saved. Go back to that and we'll close. I was unstoppable. I was a zealot. I read the book of Acts and I was like, oh, these guys are knocking on doors. And you know what I went and did? Hey, how are you doing? Hey, do you guys know Jesus? I mean... I just gave my life to Christ a couple of weeks ago. And I'm telling you what totally revolutioned my life. I revolutionized my life. It's amazing. Well, okay, you're done? All right, well, thanks. They walk next door. They close the door. Hey, how you doing? Are your parents home? Remember that one? Little girl answered the door. And I'm over standing all excited. Hey, are your parents home? She's like. I was like, no, 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 I'm saved. I, I just gave my life to Jesus. That's my wife out there. 
where'd she go? <laughs> Stranger danger. That kind of zeal. Now listen, I looked like and acted like I was like an infant, but I was an infant in Christ. I was a 32-year-old man knocking on doors, telling people I just gave my life to Jesus and I wanted to share them with you. If you're not interested, that's okay. I'm going to go to the next door. And I'll go neighborhood by neighborhood by neighborhood. And we saw hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of different homes. And some people gave their life to Christ. And some seeds were sown in people's lives that I didn't get to see the harvest. But they saw this guy that was all excited about Jesus knocking on the door. That's how we should be. Amen? I'll tell you what. It changes. It changes your, he changes your life. I want us to be transformed. I want us to be transformed. He wants us to live transformed lives. Amen?